Isaac Newton, a name we all know, came up with a fascinating argument. Imagine a bucket filled with water hanging from a rope. When you twist the rope and let go, the bucket starts spinning. At first, the water inside stays still, but eventually it starts spinning too. Here's the kicker. When the bucket and water are both spinning steadily, the water forms a curved surface climbing up the sides of the bucket. Newton observed this and asked, why does this happen? He proposed that this effect couldn't be explained just by looking at the bucket and the water. Instead, it pointed to something deeper, absolute space. According to Newton, true rotational motion isn't just about how things move relative to each other. It has to do with how they move in, in relation to this absolute space. But what is absolute space? Think of it like an invisible uh, stage where all motion happens. Even if we can't see it, it's there, defining true motion and rest. However, enter general relativity, which changed the game. Einstein's theory suggests that absolute space isn't needed. Newton's idea of absolute space was revolutionary, but it wasn't the final word. Fast forward to the 20th century when Albert Einstein introduced the theory of general relativity. This groundbreaking theory transformed our understanding of space and time. According to Einstein, space and time are interwoven into a single dynamic entity known as space-time. Objects move not through a static, absolute space, but within this flexible fabric that can bend and stretch. So, how does this relate to Newton's bucket? In general relativity, the concave shape of the water's surface can be explained without invoking absolute space. Instead, it's about how the mass of the Earth and the bucket interact with the curvature of space-time. The water's surface curves due to the centrifugal forces experienced within the rotating frame of reference. But wait, there's more. Physicist Ernst Mach had his own take on the situation. Mach argued that the forces we observe, like the centrifugal force in the spinning bucket, are due to the water's motion relative to the mass of the Earth and other celestial bodies. This idea is known as Mach's principle which influenced Einstein's development of general relativity. In essence, Marx suggested that what we perceive as absolute motion is actually relative to the distribution of mass in the universe. This means that the water's concave surface isn't a proof of absolute space, but rather a result of its interaction with everything else in the cosmos. While general relativity isn't entirely Machian, it does align with some of his ideas, showing that motion is relative and influenced by the mass and energy around us. Uh, let's take a step back in time to explore the historical and philosophical debates surrounding these ideas. These arguments and a discussion of the distinctions between absolute and relative time, space, place and motion appear in a scolium at the end of the definition section in Book 1 of Newton's seminal work, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. 1687. This book established the foundations of classical mechanics and introduced his law of universal gravitation, which provided the first quantitatively adequate dynamical explanation of planetary motion. Despite their embrace of the principle of rectilinear inertia and the recognition of the kinematical relativity of apparent motion, natural philosophers of the 17th century continued to consider true motion and rest as physically separate descriptors of an individual body. The dominant view Newton opposed was devised by René Descartes and was also supported by Gottfried Leibniz. Descartes argued that empty space is a metaphysical impossibility because space is nothing other than the extension of matter. In other words, when one speaks of the space between things, one is actually referring to the relationship that exists between those things, not to some entity that stands between them. According to this understanding, any assertion about the motion of a body boils down to a description over time in which the body under consideration is found at different times in the vicinity of different landmark bodies. Descartes recognized that there would be a real difference between a situation in which a body with movable parts is accelerated with respect to a surrounding ring and another situation in which the surrounding ring is accelerated with respect to the central object. With sole regard to the central object and the surrounding ring, the motions would be indistinguishable from each other, assuming both were absolutely rigid objects. 
However, if neither the central object nor the surrounding ring were absolutely rigid, the parts of one or both of them would tend to fly out from the axis of rotation. For contingent reasons having to do with the Inquisition, Descartes spoke of motion as both absolute and relative. By the late 19th century, the contention that all motion is relative was reintroduced, notably by Ernst Mach. When we say that a body preserves unchanged its direction and velocity in space, our assertion is nothing more or less than an abbreviated reference to the entire universe. As we continue our exploration of the concepts surrounding Newton's bucket argument, it's essential to delve into the idea of centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is a fictitious force in Newtonian mechanics, also known as an inertial or pseudo-force. This force appears to act on all objects when viewed in a rotating frame of reference and it is directed radially away from the axis of rotation. You've likely encountered centrifugal force in various rotating devices such as centrifuges, centrifugal pumps, centrifugal governors and centrifugal clutches. It also plays a role in centrifugal railways, planetary orbits and banked curves when analysed in a non-inertial reference frame like a rotating coordinate system, however here's where it gets a bit confusing. The term centrifugal force has sometimes been used to describe the reactive centrifugal force, a real frame-independent Newtonian force that exists as a reaction to a centripetal force. Understanding these distinctions is crucial for grasping the dynamics of rotating systems and how forces operate within them. By examining these forces, we gain deeper insights into both classical mechanics and the nature of motion itself.